Okay, today we're going to talk about some of the different sets of postulates we might have for geometry, and we're going to start with the classic one, Euclid's postulates. So Euclid had five things that he called uh, postulates, and uh, five things that were called common notions. Um, so the common notions are really more, they have to do with arithmetic, and they also have to do with geometry. Uh, things which are equal, things which equal the same thing are also equal one another. If equals are added to equals, the wholes are equal. If equals are subtracted from equals, the remainders are equal. Things which coincide with another equal one another, and the whole is greater than the part. Um, next is postulates. A straight line segment can be drawn joining any two points. Any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely in a straight line. Three, given any straight line segment, a circle can be drawn having the segment as a radius and one endpoint as center. Number four, all right angles are congruent. And number five, if two lines are drawn which intersect a third in such a way that the sum of the inner angles on one side is less than two right angles, then the two lines inevitably must intersect each other on that side if extended far enough. And this last one is equivalent to what's called the parallel postulate. Okay, so in fact, I'm gonna, that's true, but I'm going to take that out because it's not actually one of the postulate, part of the postulate itself. So there are a couple things that kind of might stand out to you reading through this. First of all, it's a pretty sparse set. Uh, and you might wonder if it's actually complete enough, and the answer is actually it's not. Um, and then the other thing that, a couple other things jump, might jump out at you. One is the way that they're phrased. Of course, this is obviously a, an English translation of the ancient Greek. But the phrasing is such that you can see that it's thought of in terms of constructions. So when Euclid thought of geometry, apparently a lot of it was thought of in terms of constructions, which we would call now uh, straight edge and compass type of constructions. And we're able to, saying we're able to construct certain things. Certain thing, which means, of course, that those things exist. Uh, there are some underlying assumptions that he made that are not really actually written down here as part of it. So, in a sense, Euclid's uh, postulates are not uh, complete enough. They're certainly not uh, categorical. And to do his proofs, he actually assumes some things that he didn't explicitly state. Nevertheless, this was, a, of course, a great stride uh, in mathematics. To, to just recognize that we do need a list of postulates that we must accept and uh, build a geometry from that. Of course, Euclid would have said build the geometry from that. Uh, but now, of course, we know that there's more than one geometry. Another thing that may jump out is one of these five postulates is quite different from the others, and that is number five. Well, the first four sound very straightforward, very simple, very obvious, perhaps, uh, but five is more complicated. And because of this, many people thought that there really ought to be a way to prove that fifth postulate. And so uh, a lot of effort was put into trying to prove that. Many, many, many very, very good and famous mathematicians thought they had proofs of this, when in fact, of course, they did not. As time went on, Efforts were made to uh, shore up some of the sh shortcomings in Euclid's uh, postulates and fill them in with some things that uh, filled in some of the gaps. Some alternative things that were equivalent to Euclid's fifth postulate were examined and, and proposed as uh, potential other ways of doing it. One, what, one is what's called the Euclidean parallel postulate, which is equivalent logically to the fifth postulate assuming the others are true. Um, and it goes like this. Given a line and a point not on the line, there exists uh, exactly one line through that point parallel to the given line. And uh, that version is usually attributed to uh, Playfair. So sometimes that's written as the Playfair version of the Euclidean parallel postulate. But ultimately, in 
several people were working on proofs, trying to prove that fifth postulate, and in going through that, they came very close to discovering hyperbolic geometry. Uh, Sakari particularly was one of the most prominent. They came very close. And eventually, Lobachevsky and Balai were able to actually prove that that fifth postulate is actually independent of the others by showing the existence of hyperbolic geometry. Now, of course, this is a very synthetic approach. Notice it doesn't say anything about uh, links, and in fact, the Euclid would have thought of links as being actual line segments. Um, and so, uh, this, this is a very synthetic approach. Now, uh, the great mathematician David Hilbert, probably the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, um, came up with this version of, of postulates uh, that, that we will study a little bit more. And this is the version of the postulates that we're actually using, or that Greenberg actually uses in his uh, book. Uh, in other words, your te the textbook by Greenberg. And in this, Hilbert's... Um, system, points, lines, planes, lie on, contains, between, and congruent are all undefined terms. And then he sort of grouped his axioms or postulates in uh, groups. So we have eight postulates that, that are, a couple of them are existence postulates and the others have to do with incidents, how points uh, compare to each other. For example, postulate I1 is for every two points A and B, there exists a line that contains each of the points A and B. And in postulate I2, for every two points there ex A and B, there exists no more than one line containing each of the points A and B. You could have said those two together by saying for every two points A and B, there exists exactly one line containing each of the points A and B. Uh, and that statement is also by what we meant by uh, what we mean when we say points A and B determine a line. That's what we mean by it. This is, of course, more precise the way Hilbert has said it. Um, Postulate I3 says there exist at least two points on a line and there exist at least three points that do not lie on a single line. And so forth. So you can look at these postulates. We're going to examine these in more detail as we go through the course, but just to show you some of the kinds of things that Hilbert has in his postulates. Now the next set of postulates, axioms of order, um, are basically properties of the undefined term between. And uh, actually I think pretty much all of these are, have something to do with betweenness. So for example, if a point B lies between A and C, then points A and B and C are three distinct points of a line, and B also lies between C and A. That's a property of betweenness that he's going to take as an axiom or postulate and so forth. Okay, so betweenness itself is undefined, but these give a meaning to betweenness by looking at the postulates. Postulates in group three have to do with congruence. Um, postulate three one is if A and B are two points on a line, uh, lowercase a, and A prime is a point on the same or another line, then A prime uh, then it's always possible to find a point B prime on a given side of the line A prime such that AB uh, and A prime B prime are congruent, that those two segments are congruent, and so forth. So we have a list of these things that have to do with different, different congruent things that we can make, uh, including the side angle side postulate on 3.5. Now if we just take the postulates up to that point, those will be postulates for what we're going to call um, neutral geometry, which includes hyperbolic geometry and uh, um, Euclidean geometry as well. When we throw in this version of the axiom of parallels, um, actually it's a slightly weaker version of the thing that I said with the Playfair version. If let A be any line and, and capital A be a point on, not on it, then there is at most one line in the plane that contains uh, that contains the line A and A that passes through A and does not intersect A. So there's, there's, a, there's at most one parallel line. Uh, from this we can actually prove that there's exactly one parallel line. And finally we have a couple of axioms of continuity. We have the Archimedean axiom and the line completeness axiom. And I'm not going to read all those things now. You can read those uh, at your leisure. 
and um, I think in in chapter three of the of the uh, text by Greenberg, they start going over these axioms in detail and start really working through some proofs with some of the first of them. Notice that this is a purely synthetic approach, and that's the approach the textbook by Greenberg uh, uses. That's the approach Hilbert uses used in his work. It's very classical. It uses a uh, cleaned up version of what Euclid did, so many of the same methods that Euclid used for his proofs, but just cleaned up and made more precise. Notice it does not say anything about real numbers. Uh, it doesn't talk about measures of angles or measures of line, line segments. Um, it does not appeal to any of the, the machinery of, of set theory. Uh, and as your book is very careful about presenting it, it's a very beautiful subject and it's very self-contained. And it's very, it's a, you know, completely synthetic approach. Contrast that with this set of axioms uh, by Birkhoff, and uh, Birkhoff and uh, Hilbert both from the 20th century. Uh, Birkhoff's postulates for Euclidean geometry are sometimes called postulates using um, compass and ruler because they deal with measurement. So in this version. A point, a line, a, a distance, and angle are uh, are undefined terms. Okay, but um, we have some definitions between this line segment, half line, parallel, straight angle, and so forth. Some of these things are uh, actually defined. Okay, and then the postulates, there's actually only four of them. There's a postulate of a line measure that says the points A and B up to however many points we have on line can be put into one, all the points of a line can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the real numbers. And so that we take those, those coordinates, called coordinates, and the difference in the coordinates, the absolute value of the difference in the coordinates is the distance from A to B. And so we define a distance metric on the line. So in other words, every line is a number line. And the point line postulate 2 says one and only one line contains any two distinct points, P and Q. That's just the first two postulates of Hilbert put together. And postulate 3 is the postulate of angle measure. So it has something to do with measuring angles. And a postulate of similarity is postulate 4, and which is kind of a scale Postulates. So actually just using only these postulates, but drawing heavily on the use of, of uh, the properties of the real number system, um, Birkhoff is able to develop Euclidean geometry from this basis. Notice this is a purely analytical approach. Everything is done, uh, or almost everything is done by appealing to properties of the real numbers. Now, what are we going to do in this course? Well, we're going to take a, a more middle-of-the-road approach. It's going to be mostly synthetic, like Euclid and Hilbert, but we are going to borrow a couple of ideas from Birkhoff and make use of some distance metrics, uh, measures of angles and measures of uh, distances. And so we'll be sort of a hybrid between these two. And so the set of axioms I've put together, the postulates I've put together uh, for this course will be basically the same ones as used by uh, Kay and his two textbooks that we've mentioned in the syllabus and in also which are really based on the earlier work by Moyes in his book. So um, I'll give you those set of axioms at, and probably next week and those are the axioms that we'll actually be using to write our proofs in this class most of the time. Um, but this gives you an idea of the kinds of things that might be in axioms and a little bit about the difference in the, uh, the synthetic approach, which is basically the known numbers approach, versus the uh, analytic approach, which is heavy numbers approach, heavy measurement approach.